while they're going and there's a little bit of noise. I want to thank the worship team for uh, singing the ballad that God taught me the last part of my life because my mom and myself did not get along the first half of my life, but the second half I learned to love her and see everything God had to offer her and me. My mother's name was Shirley, so Shirley's goodness and mercy will follow me. And it does. Even this morning, as you guys sang that, I went, thanks mom, thanks for the support. Because this sermon, God put this sermon on my heart. Usually he waits for the four, five, six days before I preach. But this thing came like, I, do we still use the word gangbusters? It came like gangbusters that, that God wanted to share this word. And uh, it's always scary when you get a little early. Because you have to be careful that it's not what you want to say. I always, always put the time in to make sure it's what God would want said. That being said, um, I need to take care of one little, just one other little piece of business. Can I take 30 seconds to, it's personal, but it came up yesterday during the men's breakfast. For those of you that weren't there, um, thank you for those that didn't share, because, come because there was food for 20 and only four of us were there. And do I look like I don't mind seconds? You know, so, no. Um, the part of business I want to take care of. The question was asked, if they came to my house or if they came looking for me, would there be, a, or any of us, would there be evidence enough to say I'm a Christian and what I represent? So let me just take the next 10 seconds and look straight into the camera. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I represent him. You can come and arrest me any time for believing that because I'm willing to die as my Savior died for me because it's the truth. So feel free any time. I live on the corner of 4th and Axel in Grove City, Minnesota. Come any time. Sorry, the guys put that on my heart this morning as well. All right, let's pray and then I'll go into the actual sermon. Lord God, I need your support. I need your, I need your Spirit's voice to come through me, get me out of the way, and may this message be meant for each and every person that you wanted to hear, and may it go from your heart to theirs. Amen. Raise your hand. I'm, this is going to be a little interaction for the first little bit. Raise your hand if you've ever been afraid. Look at that. Raise your hand if you're afraid right now. Thank you for those of you that are being honest and so forth. 20 years ago, yesterday, we had a real attack on our land. And it felt like what happened to the World Trade Centers happened to each and every one of us. Everyone in this room is old enough to remember exactly where they were and what you were going through the day it happened. There was a real threat, but there was a perceived threat. Just last year, 2020, there was a real and a perceived threat. I believe 2020 illustrates powerfully the power of fear and what it can do to us and through us. See, our anxieties that we experience don't need to be rooted in reality. You want an example? I was the second person through the door this morning. I came in and I closed the doors to the sanctuary and I released, because I didn't know what people might be afraid of, I released one snake, one tarantula, and one rat. Okay, that was a fib, okay? 
But for a little second there, if it was real, you know, all of a sudden you're kind of picking up your feet, you know, and think, ooh, that's a perceived fear. The enemy does the very same thing. Only he's not busy. He tries to release the equivalent of any of those things that we're afraid of. And we can become paralyzed simply by what we perceive to be a threat. Real or not, the enemy uses our fears to lay a foundation of lies that is buried beneath the layers of our own defenses to drive us in the wrong direction. That old phrase, the devil made me do it? No, the devil took you to a place through lies to where you thought you could or should do it. I was trained about 15 years ago in a type of counseling called theophastic counseling. In fact, there was just a basic training in it, and also a more elaborate in-depth for pastors and chaplains and so forth. Theophastic. Theo meaning God. Phastic meaning light. Theophastic counseling focuses in with the help of the Holy Spirit to cast light on the lies that have been planted and dug deep into a person's psyche. You don't have to be mentally ill to have the enemy plant a lie. The enemy knows no boundaries. He will plant lies into a person who is even in the womb of the mother. A one-year-old, a two-year-old, Anyone who is vulnerable, the enemy will attack. The person who actually, it was more of a discovery rather than created, but in praying and being on his knees, the individual who, who came up with the process of this theophastic counseling was amazed how little he could do with victims of incest and other sexual uh, sins and all types of other things that it became apparent that they were victims, yet lies were planted within them. He was beside himself of just giving people just the ability to tolerate the hell that Satan had created in their lives because of these experiences. What he discovered through theophastic counseling was through prayer and the help of the Holy Spirit, the lies could be revealed for what they were. They could be seen as the enemy taking advantage of the individual. I won't go into it much further, but there was a real breakthrough in the lives of these women and children that were now grown up and so forth because light was shed on a lie. One of the things I do want to point out is Satan then doesn't give up those lies very easily. He actually, in certain circumstances, will place a demon there to protect the lie. And it may be just that they check in to make sure the lie is still reinforced. We call it sometimes a stronghold in a person's life. That's just, trust me, I could go a whole hour just on what all that means and so forth. But I want you to see that God has an answer, that his truth and light can be reflected on these lies. What fears and lies are you aware of in your life? Or what fears and lies are you not aware of that are in your life? I just want to go through a few words that we use all the time when we talk about emotions and and different things that we have in our life for various reasons. 
they're all there because it's just natural as we're human that we experience these things. But I want you for just this morning and then maybe for the rest of your life be able to see each of these things as Satan's way of planting a lie within us. The simple word that we use all the time in expressing the emotion of, that we start to feel come up, anger. See, anger is truly the lie of that we may not be getting our way, that we're being treated wrong, or we're being treated disrespectfully. We feel that come up. We feel that we, the lie enables us to try and, try and do something about it. Jealousy is a lie that we may lose or not get what we desire or that we may not measure up to those that we are comparing ourselves to. Despair, that our mistakes or possible mistakes of our future might impact our future and our lives and those around us, but mostly ourselves in a negative way. Pride, that we might be found unworthy and incapable. Yet, the lie that Satan plants is, yeah, you are unworthy and you are incapable, and we see it as we have to prove ourselves then, and that's where the pride comes in. And by so doing, we are feeding our ego. I've said it from this pulpit before, my definition of ego is E-G-O, edging God out. The minute we edge God out and believe Satan's lie, we feel we have to prove our worthiness and our capability before even God would accept us. When God doesn't even accept, he accepts us and loves us that while we were yet sinners, he gave his life for us. Until we do realize we're unworthy, un incapable of taking care of our own situation, we continue to use our ego rather than turn to God. Discouragement. When the lie is that all hope is lost and that failure is probably the only outcome. Rejection or loneliness. That we're not accepted and that we will be abandoned or forgotten. And that we just don't matter. Guilt that we fear our wrongdoing or sin will be discovered and punished. Indecision, the paralysis of being scared that the lie tells us that we, we can't make a decision because we may make the wrong decision. Can you see how the lies, I gave you the example of the private, let me just take a, a, another one, that the rejection and, and loneliness. The lie is that we are rejected and lonely because that's what we feel, that's the emotion. That, and yet God says he will never leave us, nor forsake us. So why do we buy into it? What a list, huh? Wow, I mean, it's just, we all experience it. I mean, if I ask you, please raise your hand if you've experienced any one of those. It's the truth. We all feel them from time to time because we hear the lie. The enemy doesn't quit. Why? Because he's trying to keep you, he tries to drive you away, and tries to get you to go in the wrong direction. Sin, all these fears become sin because we tend to defend and protect them because we are afraid of the results, both consciously and unconsciously. So, what's the answer? Jesus Christ. God's word clearly says in Isaiah 41.10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously Look about you, for I am your God, 
I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you. If we only knew that one verse in relationship to our relationship to the one true God, we could continue to say it back to the enemy because then his lies are seen as cartoonish from the standpoint of it's ridiculous and funny that he wants to tell us these things that this verse clearly refutes. God protects and provides. Period. Therefore, no need to be frightened of Satan, his lies, or anything that comes within our purview. What is required of us to deal with this fear? The one thing, once we realize, as I asked you how many have felt each of those words or done each of those words, what is required of us is to confess, to confront any reservation that we have about his ability to protect or to provide. Let me say that again. To confront any reservation we have about his ability to protect or provide. We need to be completely open, honest, personal, and vulnerable. And the part that scared me, I'm admitting a fear, that I had to admit to God was that he had wanted me to literally be personal and vulnerable with you this morning. Because that's what's supposed to happen here in this sanctuary every Sunday morning, is that we admit our fears, our sins, and take all the power away from them. See, I have at times very much, despite knowing the Word of God, the, en the enemy has a way of attacking in areas specifically meant for us. And my fear, and the thing I've confessed this morning, is there are times I just don't trust God. I don't like some of the things that he's asked me to go through in life. My life has not turned out the way I thought it would be for being a follower of Jesus Christ. But that's a lie that I'm supporting by saying that I don't like it. See, if we look at the truth by the Holy Spirit clearly shedding God's light on it, there is not one thing that has happened in my life or in yours that God didn't either intend or allow so that we would become dependent and become the person we are meant to be, and that means be conformed to the image of his Son. I don't believe the Apostle Paul, when you read the list of the things that he went through, he, was, uh, he, he would admit, if he was standing right here, he'd say, I did not appreciate 39 lashes several times. I did not appreciate the shipwrecks. I did not appreciate some of the things that God brought me through. But there was a purpose to it. God's truth always has a purpose. And it's done in love. Romans 8 clearly say, says that everything works together for good. And we need to emphasize, yes, not everything is good. But it's going towards the good and the glory of Jesus Christ and God our Father. We need to humble ourselves before the one true God who, by our revealing our sins, of, by defending these lies and the fears that we have within our lives, we aren't allowing God to be God in our lives. 
Because in Psalm 147.3, he says, He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. As a hospital chaplain, I could not help anybody, I could not address anybody's spiritual wounds, and the doctors and the nurses and everyone I worked with could not have helped a single patient if they didn't walk through the doors and ask for help. If they didn't acknowledge the truth of their wound, their injury, and what the world had done to them. Whether it be a physical thing like a broken leg or a, a cut or whatever. Well, I'm talking spiritually here. You've been attacked. You've been injured. You have the equivalent of spiritual broken legs. You have the equivalent of gaping, gaping wounds. And if you don't acknowledge them and confess that you're hurt, for years, I walked around, I was probably one of the most wounded individuals because of what God allowed in my life. But that woundedness, once I was able to grasp that he could heal it, because that was his intent all along, then he got the glory. Because he was the only one that had the power to do so. So our choice is to simply do this. We can either hide from God, and we can, excuse, we can use every excuse possible and let the enemy give us, give us the strength to be able to continue on, to hold on to our fears and our deeper lie issues and feel all those things that I said but in a negative manner and continue to focus in on ourselves and how we think we want to handle life. Or we can come out of hiding. We can ask God to reveal our fears and the root lies that are protecting us. We can let him show his truth in our lives. See, we can either see his truth, or we can see Satan's lie. I believe we're blind a lot of times to both. But that doesn't mean they're not real and have effect on our lives. As I close here, I can honestly and boldly make this claim. You do not need in any way, shape, or form, you do not need to be concerned or afraid of being close to your Heavenly Father. If you want to have a relationship with Him, as in James we read, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. See, perfect love, God, casts out fear. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your care upon him, all your fear, your anxiety, everything on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Now, in my own unique way, and you all know I think outside the box. Let me reverse that verse in a way that is as much the truth as how I just said it. And this is according to the revised auto version. Hang on to your fears, your anxiety, with all your strength and with the help of Satan. Because he could care absolutely less than nothing you. Simply start with this prayer, found in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. One of my anxious thoughts that I had and that I am also bringing before you this morning we all are familiar with the verse that talks about standing before God and the individual is saying, I cast out demons and did this and that all in your name. And God says, I knew you not. I knew you not. And that was one of my fears. I've preached in his name. I've done all kinds of things to heal people and help. 
And the enemy tried to plant a lie that somehow, some way, God didn't know me. But this sermon was as much fit for me as it was for you this morning because of what I just said from Psalm 139. Know my heart. I've asked God to know me. And by being humble and asking him clearly to do so, he will. To know my anxious thoughts. He already knows them. But to give him permission to know me and know them and why I feel what I feel, I now can use that verse and have been using that verse for quite some time. When the enemy wants to bring that up, I say, no, one thir- Psalm 139 clearly states that as long as I've let God know who I am, he knows who I am. As long as I reveal, see, sin, lies can't, sin can't be forgiven if it's not confessed. My last statement about the world, because I don't, I cannot emphasize enough, this isn't a we-they situation. As someone said earlier, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It isn't we who believe in God, and it's they who are living in sin. We're all sinners. But I want us as individuals this morning hearing this message to be so two, two, three weeks ago Aaron said God wanted Israel to stand out like a nation so different than others our nation used to be that way because of what it was founded on don't look at the country to solve it you show the world that you're not afraid because you don't have to be. Because God wants you to stand out as his light. That there is nothing to fear. In closing, we're going to sing a hymn that... <laughs> two people told me about the hymn after God had already said it. So it was kind of like, okay, God, I, I know this is what we should sing. We're going to be singing Because He Lives. But I want to emphasize several phrases in the chorus. And I'll just trust the worship team for whatever verses they want to sing. But in the chorus, it clearly states, I can face tomorrow. Why? Because he lives. All fear is gone. I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living because he lives. If you don't remember a thing from this sermon and the enemy attacks with something you become afraid of, simply say, he lives. And because he lives, all fear is gone. Father, as the worship team comes, I want to thank you that, um, thanks for holding me up. Uh, May you be praised, may you be glorified, and may this be a foundational truth that everyone in this room can share with those they meet today and throughout this week and throughout their lifetime. Thank you, Lord. I love you. Amen.